Now that we've spent some time focusing on triggers, we want to focus now on stored routines. Stored routines encompass both procedures as well as functions. So let's set up a section called stored routines and mention that stored routines includes, again, procedures and functions. Both are different. Procedures tend to perform one or more SQL statements on the server and return those results, whereas functions generally return a single result to the user so or to the application or subject. So stored routines can manifest themselves as either procedures or functions. We're going to focus initially on stored procedures and then stored functions. But there's some things you need to know about the way MySQL implements stored routines, namely stored procedures. So let's list some of those notes as well as requirements for privileges and so forth. First and foremost, in order to create or alter procedures or routines on the MySQL DBMS server within any DBMS or with, within any DB within the DBMS that is, the user requires the alter as well as the create routine privileges. So let's simply note in order to alter slash create routines, the user must have alter slash create routine privileges. Now the routines aren't separated into or distinguished from procedures versus functions. The privileges are simply all encompassing and means that the user can alter or and or create procedures and or functions. Now the particular permissions in order to create or alter routines on a given DB are stored at the DB level. Let's take a brief look at where you can find those privileges. Currently we're in the HR database. However, the privilege is stored, which, or the privileges for alter or creation of routines are stored within the MySQL database. So let's use MySQL and we'll show tables and you notice the grant tables, DB host, etc. The stored procedures that are defined include or are defined in the proc table. They include the proc table and the per DB permissions are stored within the DB table. Let's describe DB and you'll see that a set of privileges are permissible or grantable or revocable to users on a per database basis including two key permissions that pertain primarily to routines. They include the following create routine as well as alter routine. So the privileges that we mentioned here alter slash create for routines are actually defined on a per database basis. Here they are create routine as well as alter routine these privileges may also be granted on a global scale or a global basis for a user in the user table. Let's describe user and you'll see that the user table contains many privileges as well including the ability to create routines and alter routines which means that if you grant a user the privilege to create routines and or to alter routines on a global basis within the DBMS using the user table then that particular user will be able to create and or alter routines for any of the databases managed by the DBMS. So you want to keep in mind where to apply privileges either on a DB basis or on a global DBMS basis. So that's something to keep in mind. Now we did mention the proc table as an important table with respect to stored routines. Let's show tables again and you'll see that there is this proc table. The proc table actually contains the names of the stored procedures and their values that, that are defined on the server. Let's select count star from proc to see if there are any stored procedures or functions defined or stored routines defined and as you can see zero stored routines which encompasses both functions and procedures are defined. We're going to go ahead of course and define
procedures initially then functions after. But we just wanted you to understand structurally where permissions are represented. So they're represented in three places primarily. The PROC table stores the actual procedures. And procedures, by the way, are represented on a per database basis. So when you create a procedure or a function or a stored routine, it's actually married or stored or related to a database rather than globally for the entire DBMS. The DB table contains per database stored procedures or functions privileges and the user table contains stored routines privileges. So global versus database level and one table to store all of the stored routines on the server. So that's a little bit about the privileges setup. Of course if you have full rights to the server by executing a show grant you'll reveal whether or not that's the case. In our case we have all privileges so we're free to create, alter, drop routines across the entire DBMS but you could very well define users using privileges such as create routine as well as alter routine and restrict the user to just those privileges. Now by default if a user has create routine privileges within MySQL MySQL grants that user alter privileges as well so that the user who creates a routine also inherits the ability to alter the routine if changes need to be made. So stored routines encompass procedures and functions and in order to alter or create routines the user must have alter or create routine privileges. Alter slash create routine privileges are stored in MySQL. We should include this database slash table name in between single quotes dot user table and mysql.db table. The former of course being a global permission and the latter being a per database permission. And these are explicit permissions with enum type columns for yes or no granting or denying access to those privileges. So that's a little bit about how the privileges structure works. Now why would you want to use a stored routine or define stored routine? Basically, in a nutshell, it's to be able to execute repetitive tasks or repetitive routines or functions. If there are common functions and or procedures that are executed within your environment, then ideally you should define procedures and or functions depending on which one is more appropriate so that they can be run whenever necessary and ensure consistency. The primary goal is to ensure consistency and a secondary goal is to provide a quick means of executing the common procedure and or function. So having said that, what are some of the other rules that may apply to routines within a MySQL environment? You know that they encompass both procedures and functions. In order to reference a procedure since we're going to focus on procedures first within MySQL, we use the call keyword. So use call keyword to reference stored procedures. So after we've defined a stored procedure, we'll use call in various contexts to execute the stored procedure. Now example of or an example of using the call keyword would be as follows. Simply from the MySQL terminal prompt execute call followed by the name of the routine. So routine underscore name followed by parentheses. And in between parentheses we can pass optional parameters. So we'll specify optional parameter. And usually you specify an optional parameter or argument by indicating a bracket within MySQL or when you see the syntax when you see brackets you know that it's an optional argument. So you call the routine name and this applies to functions as well as stored procedures but we're focusing on procedures procedures initially. You call the routine name followed by parentheses and if no values are to be inserted into the the procedure or routine then you simply specify a syntax which resembles call space routine name followed by an open parentheses and a closed parentheses with no arguments to be passed to the stored routine.
So that's how you call it once it's defined. It's very simple. And the reason why we're mentioning how to call it before actually showing you how to define it is because we just finished discussing triggers. And triggers support using call to call stored routines. So for example, rather than referencing multiple statements within a trigger, we could simply have a one-liner which says for each row, call a given stored routine and let the routine carry out the tasks that we'd like to have done on the server. So again, we define stored routines to accomplish repetitive tasks no differently than you define scripts within a shell environment to perform repetitive tasks. That's the real reason behind using stored procedures or stored functions. Super. Now what else should you know about these stored routines? Again, we mentioned stored routines are associated with databases, but we should note that. So stored routines are married slash associated with DBs, not the entire DBMS or global as was the case in prior versions of MySQL. So when you define these particular routines, they'll be married or associated with a database. Now that doesn't mean you can't call a stored routine from another database. If you're in a default database, for example, of HR, or currently we're in MySQL and there is a stored procedure in the HR database, you can call it by fully justifying the name. So you could call, let's just optionally mention that you could use call followed by db underscore name dot routine underscore name followed by open and close parentheses. So this is an optional way to execute a stored routine by using the fully justified name. We'll just note that this is the fully justified routine name. Super. So now that we know a little bit about how we're going, we're going to call these particular routines, we want to discuss one other rule about the routines. Now that you know that a routine is married to a database name, another thing you should know is that stored routines implicitly execute a use database statement. So stored routines implicitly execute use db underscore name prior to execution because they are married or associated with the database. So which means that the use statement is not permissible within the routines that you define. So this means that use db underscore name is not permissible within defined routines. Now this is all subject to change as is anything with information technology based systems, but this is the current rule of the MySQL land for version 5.018. If it does change, then you'll know so if your stored procedures fail to execute. But a caution before upgrading from what's considered to be a stable version to a newer version is that you check certain nuances such as how stored procedures are handled. So before moving from one version to another, if by the time you use the CBT, the stable release is considered 5.019 or 5.1, just simply check to see that the stored procedure rules in the newer version doesn't have a negative impact on the way your stored procedures are defined. But as it currently stands, stored procedures implicitly execute a use DB name based on the databases that they're tied to. And then they will be in the context of the database and then they exit the context of the database after execution. Super. So those are some of the rules behind stored procedures. Let's just recap them because next we're going to define the stored procedure and then move on to doing functions and so forth. So stored routines encompass procedures as well as functions. Two different types of repetitive modules or repetitive utilities are at our disposal. We can use procedures or functions or and or functions to perform repetitive tasks for us. In order to alter or create routines, you must have alter or create routine privileges, at least for the database in which you are, you are attempting to attach the stored routine. By default, if you have the privileges to create a routine on a particular database, MySQL will also grant you the alter 
privilege so that you can make changes to the routine. Chances are likely you may not get it correct the first time or have missed something and want to redefine or update the definition of the routine. Once your routine is defined, you use a call keyword in various contexts to reference the stored procedure or stored function. So we'll say simply stored procedure slash functions using the call keyword. The call keyword followed by the name of the routine followed by parentheses, open and close parentheses with an optional parameter specified between those parentheses to be submitted to the routine that you're calling. Now the optional parameter could be one or more. The default is to specify at least one parameter, but if your routine expects perhaps two or more par parameters or n number of parameters, you should submit n number of parameters when calling the routine. You'll know what the routine expects when you define it. You may also call stored routines by fully justifying the name of the routine by prefixing the routine with the database name. So you can specify DB name dot routine name. This is useful if, for example, you're in the context of one database. For example, we're within the context of MySQL, but intend to define a routine on a different database. This also means that you may define a routine while in the context of one database, but to have it stored on a different database by simply fully justifying the name. So when we create a routine, we may specify a leading database name followed by the routine name. So this is how you call it. Stored routines are married or associated, at least with the current release, which is 5.018, with the database, not to the entire DBMS. This means that you can have unique routine names within a database, but you may repeat the same names across databases. So you should have unique names within the database, but across databases you may reuse the same names. And also, stored routines implicitly execute use database name, and as a result, use is not permitted within the definition of your stored routine. And for obvious reasons. If a routine is married to a given database, but you instruct it to exit the context of its database and enter the context of another database, then permission issues and privilege concerns come into play. Super, so those are some of the rules. Now next, again, we're going to define our stored procedure and then move on. Let's go ahead and begin the definition of some simple procedures. So we'll label this section simple procedure definition. Now what is the syntax that is required for creating stored procedures? Of course that's the obvious question. There's a syntax requirement for doing everything within a DBMS environment such as MySQL. Here's the syntax. It's create procedure and this should come as no surprise. So create procedure is considered because it's a create command to be a DDL or a data definition language statement rather than a DML or a data manipulation language statement. So create procedure is a DDL followed by the name of the procedure. In this case we'll call it SP underscore name, stored procedure name. Again it's stored because these procedures will be stored on the server for reuse followed by open and close parentheses and in between the open and close parentheses we may specify the parameters that are required by the procedure. So let's include between brackets because it's optional proc underscore parameter comma and we'll put an ellipsis or three dots to indicate that you can specify n number of parameters. Again your stored procedure may accept one, two, three or even ten parameters to process depending on your requirements of course and it is all entirely optional. Now let's discuss what's permitted within the proc parameter section so that you have a good idea. So proc underscore parameter is defined as the following or will accept the following and we should use brackets. When you define parameters that are to be used within the stored procedure, you have options 
including in, and we'll use a pipe to separate out, and another pipe to separate in out. In out and in out, these three options that you see here define the flow of the data. When you call a stored procedure, for example, the stored procedure needs to know whether or not the flow of the data will be into the stored procedure, out of the stored procedure, or both. Depending on your requirements, once again, you may want to use one of the following or just use in out, which will allow the stored procedure to work in both ways depending on the call that's being made. As an example, when you make a call to a stored procedure, the default is to use the in proc parameter. So this is the default. This simply means that when you call the stored procedure using a call command, as we mentioned up here, if you don't specify any parameters, the default is for the stored procedure to, one, not accept parameters, but to treat everything as going into the stored procedure, allowing the stored procedure to output to the terminal monitor or to the client, the DBMS client, the result set. So in is the default. Now if you do send, let's say, a parameter, one parameter, it'll be treated as inward bound by default, which means it enters into the stored procedure and then the stored procedure accepts the parameter and performs whatever f actions on it. So you may send a parameter such as 30,000, for example, and your stored procedure may accept that 30,000 value and perform a query based on 30,000. I'm referencing 30,000 as the starting salary from our salaries table, of course, or from the pay scale table. So if we were to call it with 30,000, then the stored procedure may take the 30,000 and do something with it. That would be an example of sending inward bound a value into the stored procedure for it to perform an action on. Out, similarly, would allow you to output, let's say, into a variable. So for example, we may call the stored procedure with a variable so that when the stored procedure returns its result, result set, it isn't echo to the screen but rather stored in a variable. So for example you may call sp underscore name followed by an at symbol which is used for defining variables and we may call this particular variable test and by virtue of defining the variable if the stored procedure accepts the variable to mean that the data is outward bound after the stored procedure has performed its function the results or performed whatever statements are defined, the results will be sent outward bounds into a variable called tests, which would be at our disposal, or in other words, would be available for us to use. So we could query a stored procedure or call a stored procedure, have it output its values into this variable, and then follow up with perhaps select at test as an example to return the results. In other words, we're manipulating the data. We're moving it from disk where the tables are stored into memory and then referencing it and we may want to reference it multiple times as a as a result so let's just simply put IE as a way to use out and in out would take either form either in a variable going inbound or out and then the stored procedure based on how it's defined would handle the flow of the data correctly so we have in we have out we have in out those are some syntaxes that you need to keep in mind Whenever you're defining a variable, you should specify the direction in which it's flowing. So having said all that, let's go ahead and define some very simple stored procedures. So task, define a simple stored procedure to return results of a query. Now certainly if we wanted to return the results of a query, we could just execute the query rather than storing it in a stored procedure. But there's a legitimate use for using a stored procedure for commonly used queries. This reduces the number of errors that your users are likely to commit by storing those queries in stored procedures. So for example, if there's a common query, we're going to select star from employees momentarily. If that is a common query within your organization, then rather than having your users submit the query from various front ends including Microsoft Access, SQL, MySQL's query utility,
or MySQL's terminal monitor, simply define a stored procedure and allow users the privilege to execute the stored procedure, which, by the way, is another privilege that's stored on a per DB basis. In fact, we should just show you that very quickly. Since we're in the context of MySQL, let's do a show tables, and you'll see that we have a DB grant table. And if we describe DB, for example, you'll see that one of the columns includes the ability to execute. Execute meaning execute a routine, either privilege or function. So execute is required, but generally if a user has select privileges on the table, they're also granted the execute privilege as well. So if select's granted on the DB, that is, the execute privilege is also granted. So define a simple store procedure to return results of a commonly executed query in our organization. This is very simple. We use the syntax as laid out above, and this particular query will not accept any inbound variables or return values or results to an outbound variable. So we'll simply specify the parentheses without any parameters. It won't take parameters and it won't send output to parameters. It'll simply do what we tell it to do. So we'll create procedure and we'll call this particular procedure get underscore employees. Now it's a good idea to label your procedures with a prefix or a suffix to indicate that it is a stored procedure, although stored procedures are really only stored within one table, the proc table, so you'll know. But just for nomenclature purposes, it's good to prefix perhaps with SP. So SP underscore get underscore employees would be the name of our stored procedure. Once you've defined this far, you follow that up with open and close parentheses. And the reason why we immediately close without specifying a parameter, because again, we will define a SQL statement within a stored procedure that doesn't accept parameters inbound and will not send any results outbound into any storage repository such as a variable. So because of that, the output will always be dumped to the screen or to the output of the client, which in a terminal monitor case is simply the screen, but using a different front end, it would be some other window. So create procedure SP get employees, and once this is set, we simply execute the statement or type the statement. In this case, that's a select star from employees. We terminate with a semicolon and that's it. Our providing this there is isn't another st stored procedure on the server with the same name we would have created a stored procedure called SP underscore get underscore employees. So this will be defined on our server momentarily. Let's copy this line and paste it into the terminal monitor and watch it get created. Now again we're in the context of the MySQL database. We want this particular stored procedure to be to be defined on the HR database. So we have two options here. We can either use HR and then define the stored procedure, or we could qualify the stored procedure name by prefixing it with the name of the database. We'll show you both options. Let's use HR and then paste what we have in memory, then execute. Notice no errors were returned. And this means that we now have our first stored procedure on the server. And you may be wondering, how can you output the stored procedures that are defined on the server? Simply execute a show procedure status, and this will return the stored procedures that are defined. Let's copy this particular syntax, or this command, into our notes. And we'll just simply note to reveal stored routines, in this case procedures, execute show procedure status, and this will retu return the procedures that are defined. And the fields are pretty self-explanatory. Again, we mentioned that a procedure is married to a database. So notice our very first store procedure is married to the HR database. The definer is the user root at localhost. This is the person who has been granted both create as well as alter privileges, but because we're logged in as root, we have full privileges to the entire DBMS anyway.
The modified column stores when the particular procedure was last modified. The create column stores when it was last created. Super. So it's very easy to understand what's happening here. The procedure exists on the server and we're free to execute it at any particular point. Now if you want to drop the procedure, simply execute a drop procedure command and that'll get rid of the procedure for you. We'll show you that later on. For now we simply want to execute the procedure. So let's make some space here and what we'll do is execute a call. Now this is not case sensitive. You could use a mixed case or a lower case. Doesn't matter. Let's call the name of our stored procedure which we've defined as sp underscore get underscore employees and we'll paste that into the shell, the terminal environment, followed by open and close parentheses. If you admit the open and close parentheses and attempt to terminate this statement and execute it, look at what happens. An error is returned. The MySQL terminal monitor doesn't understand the command. So let's go ahead and properly terminate the name of the stored procedure by including opening and closing parentheses and now notice the procedure has executed. What has it done? It's returned all rows and all columns so everything from the employees table so it works as promised. Now certainly you could define a more refined stored procedure such as selecting specific columns that's easy as well. Let's define yet another one just to show you that it is possible this will call employees2 just for simplicity and will select specific columns such as F name, L name, and maybe we'll pick some other interesting value. Let's go ahead and find something that's of interest such as start underscore date. Start underscore date. Now certainly when you define your stored procedures they should be as descriptive as possible. So they should indicate what the procedure does. So simply saying SP get employees 2 doesn't say enough. We could say SP get employees name start date. And this more accurately describes what the stored procedure does. Now we did mention we could fully qualify the name of a stored procedure. So let's do that. The name of the DB is HR dot. Now it's fully qualified. But in order to show this in action accurately, we'll need to switch the context of our current DB, which is HR. So we'll use MySQL, which is another DB defined on the server. Has to be there, otherwise your MySQL instance is invalid. And from within the context of MySQL, we'll control shift V to paste what's in the buffer in the Linux box's memory and then we'll enter to execute this particular stored procedure. Notice it executed with no errors. Had we not fully qualified the name of the stored procedure with the HR database, as you know, the stored procedure would have been created on the MySQL database. So that's something to keep in mind. If we select star from proc, which is the name of the table that stores the various stored procedures, you'll see that there is a new stored procedure that's married to the HR database called sp underscore get underscore employees underscore name underscore start. Let's copy this name into memory because we're going to call it momentarily using a mixed case call. followed by the name of the stored procedure followed by open and close parentheses and as you can see the one error that we have here is that we are in the context of the MySQL database attempting to execute a stored procedure that is married or associated with the HR database so to call a stored procedure when you are out of context Again, qualify the name of the stored procedure. So we'll go ahead and specify HR dot, and notice it executes with the mixed case call. So it doesn't matter. Case is irrelevant, and what's returned includes first name, last name, and start date. So this should also tell you that you can define stored procedures that are more complex, for example, that perform joins. Well, let's just go ahead before we move on and we'll define a new stored procedure. We'll call this particular stored procedure SP underscore get employees underscore salary. And this may be 
a store procedure that you want to restrict. Let's select the columns and perform the join. So we'll select first name, last name, as well as the salaries from two tables, employees, comma, pay underscore scale, where employees dot pay underscore scale dot I underscore ID that is is equivalent to pay underscore scale dot ID. This should perform the proper left join and allow us to create the procedure. Now it's always a good idea for any DBMS whether it be MySQL, Microsoft SQL, Oracle, DBMS, DB2 that is, any DBMS to test your select statement prior to committing the store procedure to the screen to the DBMS via the screen because this will avoid you having to alter the store procedure. So go ahead and execute the query from the proper context. So let's use HR and ensure that it works. Once you know that it works, then commit it. And we know that it works, so we'll create this new store procedure and let's shift context. Now if you are in the proper context, this, for example the HR context, and you create a procedure with a fully qualified name, it also works. Also notice this time there were no spaces between salary and the parentheses. A space is not required. MySQL properly parses it. Super. So now let's show all of the procedures that exist. We'll show procedures status and you'll see that we now have an additional procedure. Three rows, three procedures. SP get employee salary. We'll call it. And that's SP dot. And again, if you fully qualified, it still works even if you're within the right context. So call HR dot SP underscore get underscore employees underscore salary. We'll return the employee salary. Let's just double check our syntax. And of course we're missing the terminating open and close paren and there you have it. So it returns nicely. Super. So next we're going to show you how to create multi-statement stored procedures before moving on to functions. In this section we're going to focus still on stored procedures but we want to focus on multiple statements within a stored procedure as well as using the out parameter to send output into a variable. So essentially we'll be selecting data from the table space and table data as you know is stored on the file system. So let's just take a brief look at that. We'll control shift T and SUN and we'll navigate into varlib mysql and for any database you know that the DBs are stored within their respective DB names as containers. So let's go into HR and the table data is stored in the various files that you see here, especially the files with the .myd extension. So when we use stored procedures to select the results of let's say a table such as a count into a variable, we're actually moving the data from the file system in this case a file on the file system named table.myd into memory so that it can be reused for subsequent purposes but since database systems are subject to change you generally only want to perform this sort of function in a limited time constraint so that if the data changes your updates or refreshes of the variable will reflect accordingly Super. So let's go ahead and define what we're going to do here. So our new task is to first define, before we move on to multiple statements, define a stored procedure that sends a result to a variable. And this uses the out syntax or the out keyword. So what is something that we'd like to store into a variable for reuse? Well, a simple example is a count, but you could use SQL to perform aggregate functions or to calculate other things using the math capabilities and store the output, how outputted scalar value into a variable for reuse or into multiple variables for reuse.
But to illustrate a simple example, let's say we take a count of employees and then define the stored procedure as a stored procedure which stores the number of employees within our table. So as you know, the syntax requires that we use create procedure, followed by, of course, the procedure name. In this case, we'll call the procedure sp underscore get total employees. Again, to get a total number of employees, a simple select count would suffice. But you may want to perform other functions or may have very large data sets where a third procedure would be ideal. So get total employees, and instead of defining blank parentheses or no values or parameters between parentheses, we're going to use the keyword out. The reason why we're using the keyword out because is because the default behavior of stored procedures is to accept parameters inbound or inward into the stored procedure. So we need to specify out so that when the query that we execute runs, it will send the result outward into a variable that can be reused throughout our session. So out is the keyword that we need to effect what we're attempting to do, as well as in out. If we use the optional in out, this would work as well. And depending on the context, my SQL would decide whether or not the parameter is to use inbound, outward, or outbound, or both ways. So we'll use out because we know the flow of the data and this parameter. And we will define a parameter name. And that parameter name we'll call total underscore employees. That should suffice. We do need to define the type of the variable, however. The type for our intents and purposes will be integer. Now let's just discuss the type and this whole syntax that you see here. Out controls the flow of the data. The name is followed, so we're using a name called total underscore employees. But the type corresponds to any supported MySQL data types. It could be var car, car, integer, numeric, any, any of the numeric values, decimal, etc you do need to specify the data type. So really, the syntax when using parameters, procedure parameters, includes the following. Create procedure followed by sp underscore name for stored procedure name followed by the parentheses and either in, out, or in, out followed by variable name followed by variable type. This is the syntax. And the type corresponds to any supported MySQL type. As you know, we've covered pretty much most of the types supported by MySQL. So you'll need to select the type. We're going to perform a, a count here. It's a simple count. And a count will return an integer. Before putting it into our command, let's just show you from the shell what it looks like. We'll select count, and we've done it many times. Count star, which counts all rows from employees. The count star function returns simply one value, which tells us that there are four employees, Trisha, Dean, Diana, Eamon. This value represents an integer. It would actually fit into a tiny int, but for the sake of providing room for a large number of employees will simply specify int. But we could specify tiny int since the value is very small. Once we've taken care of the, the procedure parameter requirement, and by the way, you can define multiple proce parameters, procedure parameters, by separating them by a comma, so et cetera, et cetera, ellipsis. Once this is out of the way, we do need to go on and define the statement, which we'll do on a separate line. And that statement is simply what we just typed in, which is select count star and this is where it gets a little tricky rather than outputting to the screen we're gonna instruct select to select into as you know you can select into an out file we've shown you that which means you select the results and rather than dumping the results to the screen the results are dumped to a file somewhere on the file system beneath varlive mysql or somewhere where the currently logged in user has write permissions but in the case where you want to select a given scalar value, this is a scalar value or a single value that will be returned into a variable, you need to specify the variable name. The variable name will match the same name that we've specified in the procedure parameters parentheses section. So we will select into total 
underscore employees. Remember, total employees will be sent out to the call function. So we are going to create a procedure that sends its results outbound into some variable called total underscore employees. But within the memory space or within the context of the stored procedure, we'll need to select the scalar value, which is returned by count star, into a variable. That variable needs to match what's defined in the parentheses. If you have multiple variables, then specify the one that the particular select sequence should be redirected to. So we'll select into total employees, and we'll of course need to specify the table that we'd like to perform the count on, and that's the employees table. Once that's out of the way, the stored procedure is ready to go. Let's go ahead and create this new stored procedure and it will be tied to the HR table so we don't need to fully qualify it. Now we have a new stored procedure which we can output using show procedure status or we can confirm that it exists by using show procedure status and there it is SP underscore get total employees. Now let's attempt to execute or call get on SP underscore get underscore total underscore employees using call. You'll notice that this particular stored procedure requires one argument. MySQL is smart enough to tell you that it expected one but got zero. So we'll need to specify the argument, but the way you specify the argument is again a little bit tricky if you're not familiar with SQL syntax. So let's show you how you do that. To return slash call results of out configured stored procedure we'll do the following we'll call SP underscore get underscore total underscore employees but we will then need to define a variable using the at symbol to temporarily house the result we can call this, this variable anything we want let's just simply call it total underscore employees for simplicity but this isn't a requirement it could be called anything again we're operating inside of two different memory spaces the stored procedures space or context as well as the users terminal space so let's paste that name and in fact we pasted the entire thing let's erase it or backslash C to get out so we'll control shift V and now we're going to call SP underscore get underscore total underscore employees and its output will be redirected to some variable called total employees. Once executed, notice nothing's echoed to the screen, which is exactly what we expect, and or what we expected. And now, if we execute a select at total underscore employees, the result will be returned, and that's four. So to go through that logic again, in order to create a procedure which will send its output to a variable, you need to define the procedure and you'll also need to define one or more parameters or procedure parameters. We define the flow of the data using out followed by a variable name. This variable name will be used internally within the stored procedure and its type is required. It's an integer. We then perform the query, select count star, but instead of sending it to the screen we select it into the variable name. That's where it's stored in memory. So the results are stored in memory rather than on the user's screen. Of course, we specify the table, and once that's stored, in order to call it, we call it with its name, followed by a temporary variable name to use within our operating environment, or our memory space. That variable persists for the duration of a session, but it may or may not be accurate. So for example, if we inserted a new employee, the variable still represents four. As you know, the current variable or the current number of employees is four re reflected by the variable But again if you go ahead and put in a new employee this variable still reflects four which means you would need to rerun the stored procedure to get the new value so just keep that in mind but that should be pretty obvious now the way you run multiple statements is similar to the way we showed you within the trigger section you're going to use a begin and end statement and you're going to alter the delimiters in order for it to work so we're going to copy basically the syntax that you see here and define it for our stored procedure. Let's label this section as executing multiple statements in a stored procedure.
and we'll paste the syntax that we just copied and alter it slightly to suit our needs. We do need to alter the delimiter. It doesn't need to be altered to pipe. It just needs to be altered to something other than semicolon so that we can define the statements and avoid the terminal monitor interpreting those statements. Once we've altered the delimiter, which we'll do, we then need to create, of course, the procedure. So we'll create a procedure. And let's call this particular procedure sp underscore get employees total and salary because we want this particular store procedure to do two things one it'll get the employees total by doing a select count star and two it'll perform a join to return the employees salaries now we need to get rid of this after insert stuff because this is trigger related so let's get rid of it and once we've specified the name of the stored procedure we then begin now we don't need the for each row for each row applies primarily to triggers but we do need to begin the stored procedure and specify n number of statements followed by an end so the first statement is to select count star from employees that's our first statement that will return the total number of employees the second statement is to perform the join to return the columns that we're interested in which includes the employees salaries which we'll do by selecting f name comma l name comma salaries from and this is the same query we've been running employees comma pay underscore scale where employees dot pay underscore scale dot I underscore ID that is is equivalent to pay underscore scale dot ID so this will perform the join and will be our second of two statements within a multi statement stored procedure this will be stored momentarily so let's paste this in and see what occurs and of course at the end we want to reset the delimiter to be semicolon so we can continue operating as we normally expect MySQL to behave let's go to the shell and we'll paste it notice everything ran as expected no errors and the delimiter has been reset we'll validate that it has been by executing a show procedures status and it works we now have a fifth stored procedure called sp underscore get underscore total underscore employees now let's just check that with our name sp and the sp underscore employees total and, and salary is the actual name that one's defined right above and there it is just sorted differently because get employees comes before get employ or get total so it's just sorted by the name of the stored procedure so now that it exists let's attempt to execute it this particular stored procedure does not accept any parameters which means we'll simply call it by its name followed by open and close parentheses and a semicolon to terminate the statement this will do two, two things for us first it performs a count second it performs a join and returns the first name last name and the, the employees salaries so it does exactly what we want it to do which is perform multiple statements. Now we could have defined this particular stored procedure with three, four, five, ten, a hundred statements. But once you see two or more, then the concept has been proven and nothing else needs to be said. So it's in place. We can define multiple statements in a stored procedure. Simply alter the delimiter, create your procedure, and rather than specifying one statement, just include between begin and end statements or keywords any number of statements that you want when finish end with the proper termination character followed by the temporary termination character and then when you're finished reset the delimiters and then you're good to go that new procedure exists and is accessible and can be run by anyone who has execute privileges on the particular database so this particular stored procedure is in place now certainly it could be changed to include additional columns using the alter statement the alter statement for procedure works similarly to the create statement no differently than is the case with other things that we've looked at such as altering tables and so forth
So that's a little bit about creating stored procedures using multiple statements, as well as using the out keyword to send a value such as count to the terminal so that we can store it in a, in a variable. So we've extracted a scalar value by using a count function and returning the count for the rows and so forth. So we know how to define basic stored procedures which just perform for us a simple query as well as stored procedures that can send data to variables which we can query directly although they're subject to becoming stale so you need to keep that in mind. Again if we inserted a new employee then it would become stale quite quickly. And we also know how to define multiple statements within a particular stored procedure. And one key differentiator between stored procedures and functions is that stored procedures can, re can execute commands such as select commands that return full result sets whereas functions cannot. So in a case where you select a full result set you get output such as the following. Functions aren't suited for returning this sort of information but rather for returning scalars such as a single value. But next we're going to be looking at functions anyway so you get a sense for the differences between them and procedures.